Kate. That is Ritter. Oh, okay. Awesome. You guys have just missed all the really good stuff. Uh, uh, the, the, um, I read this book by Mark Winston called The Biology of the Honeybee. And I can remember having been a lifetime reader and comics reader thinking, oh my gosh, this would make a great comic. Someone should do a comic about bees. And uh, it didn't occur to me until about a year later, because I'm not very smart, that after years of cartooning in college and graduate school, well, maybe that could be me. Uh, so at the time I came to that conclusion, I was in my first year of uh, postdoctoral work at the Rothenbuehler Honeybee Lab, which is no longer there, at Ohio State University. I didn't break it, by the way. Um, and I applied for a grant from the National Institutes of Mental Health for three-year postdoctoral research, full salary, blah, 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 blah. And a $1,500 grant from a place called the Zurich Foundation, which was a funding agency created by Peter Laird, who was one of the guys that created Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he created this, this foundation to fund independent comics creators, because in the 1990s, unless you had giant guns, big breasts, uh, bandana or whatever, people didn't want to publish that comic. Get big guns, big guns, then that was really exciting for people. So no one was going to do uh, a comic about bees. And so I applied for that grant. I, I wound up getting both of them in the same week. One was for multiple thousands of dollars. One was for $1,500 to publish a single floppy comic. And honestly, I was much more excited about the $1,500 because I thought I could do science, but this was the first sort of external validation that, that I could do science comics, all right? Since then, I've done comics about uh, beetles and uh, just some follicle mite stuff. And I got an ant book that I just sold and that will be coming out probably next year. And yes, all right, that's my, the other thing I do is short stories. Uh, I do these primarily for my students, uh, but then I post them and make them available free as PDFs online. Uh, and so if you go to G, I have a handout uh, that we'll use in a little bit, but uh, you can download these PDFs, use them for classes, they're on photosynthesis, et cetera, et cetera. They're not all entomologically based, but they all star uh, two characters, Wilbur and Aunt Edna. And it's Ant, A-N-T, Edna, and Wilbur is a little fly. And these are based on characters that my father uh, sto told me stories about when I was a kid. And he was not an entomologist. He was a basketball coach and a junior high school guidance counselor. But that was the moment when sort of I distilled this idea of cartoon insects and their utility in storytelling. The last thing I do is uh, because it can take years for a book to come out and it can take months for a short story to be finished, I will also post short cartoons online, all right? So that's sort of the milieu that I'm working in. Um, I'm gonna tell you about my basic philosophy and how to construct these things. And I'm gonna talk about how I do it, but at the end, I'm gonna talk about things that you could do in terms of as a, a mechanism for outreach. Um, it sounds scary to do comics and cartoons, but the truth is if you're dealing with kids, kids are fearless. So adults, we tend to be cowards. Kids, they have no idea what they can't do. And so they just assume they can, usually. And as a, as a result, you up front don't have to know exactly what you're doing because they will figure it out for themselves. All right? Okay, let's see the next one. Oh, wait, I do want to say one thing about this. This particular short was a two pager. I'm going to show you. I, I have a handout with both of them. Um, it was done as supplementary material for a paper published in PLOS by Adriana Briscoe on um, sexual dimorphisms in various Heliconus butterflies. So it was a cool comic embedded in with a paper. Okay, now you can go to the next slide. All right, so why make these comics? Um, because not every kid, and I grew up, I grew up, I grew up in a rural environment. Uh, I work in a rural environment. Uh, my, my wife is a middle school teacher, and I've got two kids who went through the system. And what we see and what national trends show is that, bam, right about middle school, uh, kids decide they never want to take another science class again. <laughs> 
And unfortunately, that trend is hitting girls and people of color, students of color, more uh, profoundly than people who look like me. So not only are we losing people, but we're losing diversity of thought and perspective, right? Um, so I think I want to contribute in some way of exciting kids at that stage in life. Uh, and so a lot of what I'll talk about is my mechanism for trying to do that. Um, it's, it never hurts to have a Rachel Carson quote. I do think that if you don't have a person directly in your life who's running around with you, picking up bugs, putting stick insects in your hair, like I did with my kids, the next best thing is the written down material of their brain, right? Which is why a book is as close to human magic as possible, right? That you get in a book, the ideas from a brain that may be dead for a long time that can connect with a kid. Um, and, you know, I've had some anecdotal evidence at the Small Press Expo. Actually, I've been there many a times. Um, you know, I have had kids come up to me. I had two college age women come up to me and say, oh, you know, our dad read your B book to us when we were little. And as they're talking about the B book, they start to cry because, spoilers, the B dies. And, and so I'm looking at these kids going, you're crying over a cartoon B that never existed. So those are the connections that stories can build in a way that I don't think textbooks can, frankly. Now, don't get me wrong. I think I said this at lunch. If I get a free textbook, a table copy to examine, I know what I'm doing for the weekend. Woo! But that's not the way everybody is, right? That's not the way everyone approaches, approaches this topic. So, okay, next slide. So how do I do it? Um, I, I, I do it by building stories that will help me create a vehicle for explaining ideas. Um, so on the left here, I got Last of the Sandwalkers. Now, uh, I'm gonna talk about my sliding scale of anthropomorphization, which makes every scientist nervous. So I'm gonna explain myself. <laughs> uh, but uh, Last of the Sandwalkers, it's about a, uh, a, a family of beetles for various regions. They're betrayed by the bad guy beetle. They're thrown out of their oasis across the desert into our world, right? And so it's a mechanism to show kids or readers common everyday things like a velvet worm or, uh, you know, um, various types of insects and beetles, right? That are common in every day, but are wondrous in their uniqueness. Right. And so it was a vehicle to talk specifically about beetles that um, that hopefully makes them more exciting or exciting for the kids. Biography of a honeybee. I'll sort of focus most of my stuff on this just to keep things straightforward and simple. And then the book on ants that's coming out soon is Kushi. And the premise of this is that she is a cartoon ant, not even remotely accurate anatomically, I know, um, but she is born into a colony of leaf cutters that are real. So she can't talk to any. The story is about being lonely. The story is about finding a friend. She eventually finds a friend. And then, oh, there's a twist with the friend. And then there's a thing about acceptance and then boom, what it means to be home, friendship. Right, so there are all these very human things that we'll talk about in a little bit. So highly stylized cartoony here, but entrenched in a world that is as real, right? Or accurate as I can make it, right? So those are the books that I've been doing. What's the next slide? Yeah, so here's the sliding scale of anthropomorphization, right? So. I will take you, uh, we'll start with uh, Under the, the Sea Wind by Rachel Carson. Has anyone read that? It's an extraordinary book. Um, the animals don't talk. We get a little bit of anthropomorphization in terms of hearing what they think and want. But, you know, I think all within relative reason in terms of 
uh, a display of what their behavioral output is. Uh, watership down a little bit further to the right in terms of anthropomorphization. Here they do talk to each other, right? They don't have tools or you know rabbit-based inventions or jetpacks or anything like that. And they can sort of talk to a gull, so they're interacting with other species. Pulls them a little bit this way. At the other end of the spectrum is the bug's life, which messes up so much stuff. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I have not even seen the B movie, so don't. But I can remember uh, The Bug's Life watching it with my kids, and they were this big at the time. And there were a couple lessons I learned from it. First is that if you put something in a story for a kid this age, oh, they'll remember it. And all the wrong stuff you put in there, no, they totally remember that. My youngest son loved to run around the house and tell me that ants only have four legs. He just knew that was. Uh, and I can remember seeing in the movie theater with them, and there was a scene where they, they you know, the, the Flick, is that his name? Flick, comes into that bar. He's sitting at the bar, and this drunk mosquito comes up and says, give me some A positive. And all I could think was, that's a guy's voice. <laughs> that is a guy's voice. And it's not that hard to get right. It would have been funnier with Phyllis Diller or something, right? I mean, so this is where I was watching the bug slide. That's highly anthropomorphized tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would put way of the hive down here, right? I've got bees and they're all talking to each other. And they can actually talk to a flower. There's Bloomington, the flower. They can talk to a beetle. So there's some cross species discussions going on. This one's at the other end of the spectrum. Um, we've got beetles from a different society. And I can remember when I was working on this, a number of my friends were like, oh, are, you, are you worried that kids will think that there are some beetles that build tools? And I said, about as worried as I am that they think some coyotes purchase things from Acme <laughs> and drop anvils on roadrunners. That was my level of concern for that. Kids typically know if you are absurd enough what they can sort the wheat from the chain. Not always, but so here they've got some tools, but they are thrown into our world without tools. So it's very much nature as we see it. And, but they do also talk to the other beetles, right? So there's that cross species communication. That's over here. And then Kushi, she, for me, I, I tried in PowerPoint to have two lines that went like this, but I lacked the technical savviness to do that because at some level, she's ridiculously cartoony. She's way over here, right? But the world she inhabits is much more closer to the Carson world. So someplace in between. So um, anthropomorphization is one of those things that makes us nervous. And as an animal behaviorist trained by Harold Esch, who was trained by Carl von Frisch, I will, I will absolutely tell you it is something that always makes me nervous too when I'm teaching animal behavior, saying that that animal wants X, Y, or Z. So why do I do it? Because it's a trade-off worth making. It is absolutely a trade-off worth making if um, you can work to find and encourage enthusiasm about the natural world. All right, so next one. All right, so here's the guiding philosophy. Maintaining the integrity of the science also maintains its beauty. So um, you will see stories in which uh, they decided this is the story and I'm gonna take this science fact and I'm gonna bend it to fit my story, right? And you look at it and you go, oh, cringe, that doesn't really work, right? That's never the way it should go in my mind. You, you look at the science that you want, the science that you want to maintain, and then you weave your story around those guideposts, all right? You find a way to be as close to accurate as you can be and construct your story. That's what a storyteller does. That's the hard part of storytelling. And if you can't do it, then you gotta rethink because ultimately you do, I do at least, want there to be some integrity so that a kid feels like as they come up to me at, at shows and they start telling me all this stuff about beats, 
like, oh, I read your book. You know, you know, there aren't many boys in the hive. I, I know that. <laughs> and you know, only the girls can sing. I, yes, I did know that. And the, the, the joy they have when they can tell me what they read, right? Um, that's what we're going for. And I always use this uh, paraphrase of a Sherlock Holmes quote. It's a capital fake mistake to tell stories. So this would be to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist the, the facts to suit stories instead of telling stories to suit the facts. I try to tell stories to suit the facts. Um, and what that means is it's not particularly easy and it takes me a long time to do it. So I'm not super fast, but I think by the end of most stories, uh, I usually, you know, I, I usually think I've done a pretty good job, right? There's a balancing act between self-delusion and self-criticism. If you're too self-critical, you get nothing done. If you're delusional, you don't do anything good. And so I've got this balancing act, I think, at least for me, for the two. All right, what's the next slide? All right, so if you are going to tell a story, and, and these are things to think about in your teaching, they're things to think about as you're doing outreach, I mean, I've spent 23 years, my main job is teaching kids um, and teaching them to write and teaching them to write about what I've taught them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A children's librarian once told me after um, one talk, uh, a framework, she said, I see this in your work, you should, you should frame it this way. And I have ever since. An effective story has two components, especially for kids a mirror and a window. Now the mirror is gonna tell you something or show you something you recognize, something about your life, something you can connect to and identify with, All right? That's the mirror. Uh, so I did this book about honeybees. How am I like a honeybee? Well, uh, I live, I die. I would like to avoid dying. I think bees would like to avoid dying if they can, right? Uh, things change. You have to respond to the environment and you have to deal with others, whether you're a social insect that's dealing with your sisters or whether you're a solitary insect that has to collect cow poop, right? Either way, you are interacting with organisms. Those are all shared things and you can use those to construct stories where you tap into uh, a human quality give a human quality to your work. The window, that is showing kids or readers a completely different world, one that's totally alien to them, right? Star Trek classically was really good at this, right? I mean, here they are shooting through space, sitting in the living room with their great big screen TV, right? And they have episodes where they visit a planet where half the population is white on one side and the, or a smaller proportion are white on the left side, right? And of course, everyone goes, ho, 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 how silly to discriminate, right? And the, 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 the message is clear, right? You're tapping into the notions that things that humans do and you're underscoring in this particular case, how ridiculous it is. So that's the mirror and the window showing us a world. So I like to, I always like to point out that bees secrete wax just like you secrete wax. But the difference is they pull their wax off and build their house. So if you imagine maybe you find that significant somebody, you tie the knot and then you start saving for a house by rooting around in your ear. You got the wax jar. I think we got the living room just about done, honey, right? That's a weird, weird way to look at things. That's a novel for kids, novel for readers in general. So if you can frame things as that, and, and, I, and I would argue a lot of the things I'm telling you, these are things you can think about while you're giving a talk about your topic of choice, that you're going to show us something weird, and you probably already do this anyway, but finding a way to connect it in an interesting fashion or draw distinctions between what if, you know, what if we reproduced like flowers? And I had to have someone carry my semen over to Lisa, right, in order to impregnate her. That would be weird, right? Uh, all right. I won't say anything more about that. And pray, and, and pray that Lisa doesn't hear I use that example. Um, 
<laughs> oh dear. So, um, which mirror and window approach to storytelling? It can provide you with a whole bunch of different ways to couch a story, right? So, Kushi, as I indicated, um, this is a story about a cartoon bee. Here's the back end. Here's a uh, one of the leaf cutters inside the, in the inside the colony. Uh, in this opening sequence, she's just had an argument with this ant. And what you can't see is that she did the voice of the ant. So she was really just arguing with herself. And here she's come back to the ant feeling guilty. It's me again. I, I'm sorry I got mad. And then she drops down and does the voice of the ant, right? Oh, me too, you know? And oh, I apologize. She accepts, she hugs. If that doesn't underscore a certain element of loneliness, and for me as a kid who was oftentimes lonely growing up, man, I can really identify with this. I, I can, uh, which makes it easier for me to write. You know, but then she's going to meet somebody and she's going to have a friend, but that friend turns out not to be exactly who she thinks that friend is. And so now we have a story of acceptance. Uh, can you accept who this individual is? The Way of the Hive, uh, the biography of Miyuki, uh, is really a story about a fear of death, a fear of change, and how we try to avoid doing certain things so we don't fail, right? Now, I've said this before to people, if you ever want to read my biography, just buy all of my books, right? <laughs> because that fear of death and dying, that's very real. But being lonely, that's very real, right? So the other thing that helps when you're telling a story is that personal element to it, right? And it's gonna make it much more compelling. And honestly, that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the human element of your story. You give them some human, they're gonna to listen to virtually anything you tell them about parasitoids, right? Which are intrinsically interesting, right? To us. <laughs> All right, right? All right, how about the next one? So comics as an approach offers the unique um, ability to make the invisible visible. Now, sure, you could do this with film as well, right? Uh, but you would need an elaborate camera and some nice technology. I use stuff called paper and a pencil and ink, right? So the power to do something like this is, I think, uh, much more uh, readily available to you as a creator. So for me, as somebody who did a lot of sensory biology work, looking at the umwelt, right, the personal sensory or behavioral experience of an organism is profoundly fascinating. And it helps tap into the entire window portion of this, right? And so here I've got a split screen of Miyuki uh, picking pollen and nectar from her friend Bloomington, uh, the talking flower. And, you know, the top panel, we see what the flower looks like to us. And as they're talking and explaining, we, we see what the flower might kind of look like to them. Now, obviously, I've maintained the yellow here, which is not probably what it would look like, but we get the UV markings you know, the landing strips that we see on pedals, et cetera. So this juxtaposition allows us to provide visually what might be otherwise difficult to explain even, right? So something transitional between film and text. All right, next one. So there are certain challenges if you, <laughs> there are certain challenges if you have decided I am going to make a book about bees and I'm going to make those bees look real, it depends so much as these naked apes on this rubbery countenance that we have, right? I can raise an eyebrow at my children very subtly and they'll know exactly what I mean, right? I can greet them at the airport like this and embarrass the hell out of them. Right, because that's just too much enthusiasm, Dad. It's too much enthusiasm. I don't have to even grimace 
for Elisa to know something bothering me, right? So we rely in terms of storytellers, right? If you go to the movies, they don't have a continuous running shot of people's bellies. It's their faces. If you get a close up, it's not like, hey, let's get a close up of their foot. It's a close up of their face. Why? Because that's where all the information is. This is where all the information is. And these, I was committed not to having camera eyes okay, and not having rubbery mouths or eyelids to show that they're girl insects. <laughs> and, so, and so prior to working on this book, I spent a long time figuring out how am I going to do emotions? How am I gonna do emotions on these things faces? Turns out antenna, they make great eyebrows, right? It also turns out that if I open their mandibles in certain ways, your brain sort of fills in the gap and you can see the mouth, right? I mean, the human brain is, is tremendously um, effective at finding the patterns it's familiar with if you get it close. And so while I wound up having uh, to do a lot of practice to make sure I could convey emotions like surprise, anger, uh, happiness, a little bit disconcerted, kind of scared, stick your tongue out. <coughs> I saw this expression all the time when I was training honeybees at the honeybee lab because I did classical conditioning. This thing called proboscis extension reflex. You guys ever heard about this? You essentially put the bee in a, in a test chamber with a little puff of, well, a little cartridge of odor. And the odor puffs on, it blows for four seconds. And then there's, we're like trained monkeys. After three seconds, there's a beep. And then I, I touch its antenna with a sucrose solution. It extends its proboscis and it sucks it up, right? Eventually, they build a, uh, a, um, an association between the two. So the odor will come on and they will extend their proboscis before the beep. Now, unlike my students, they make this association about the second or third trial of 10, right? It's very quick. So I've had bees sticking their tongues out at me quite a bit. You can actually train, you can train them to noxious odors, things they don't like, and they will make this face. They will literally fold their mandibles up and look, and I don't have it on here, but they will cross their antenna too. Like, nah, I don't like that. Anyway, um, so I looked at a lot of bee faces and uh, that's what I came up with. All right, we've got to get Deborah Keel in <coughs> and go to the next slide. Distinctiveness. This was the second biggest thing I was worried about. Deborah, she needs to get in. Got to come in to see the last three slides. Um, distinctiveness uh, was probably my second biggest concern in a hive of 16,000. You know, all. Uh, at an assistant at um, Christy Buxton, whose fiance was spoke Farsi, and I asked her, okay, yeah. uh, this is Miyuki, it's Swahili for B. I got that name from Sharoni Shafir, who was also in the lab. He wrote a, um, he wrote some code to analyze data, and he named it Miyuki because he thought that was cute. I thought it was cute too. This is Devora, it's Hebrew for B, and this is Queen Hachi which is Japanese food. How do I make them distinct? Well, um, I had Miyuki look like Miyuki, right? Devora, her older sister, she's missing an antenna, right? Now it's not a big thing, but once you key into it, you can see it, right? So there are two things. Um, you key into that, you see that difference, but also context of conversation, the voice of each character can guide a kid. I literally had no one ever tell me I can't keep the bees straight. And I have, I've been surrounded with little kids my whole life. They are brutally honest with me. Um, in fact, like, so just to give you uh, a notion of the brutal honesty, I once shaved my beard and my children cried. 
because I was ugly. <laughs> Jack's, Jack's exact words were, you've got to grow it back, Dad. You're ugly. <laughs> so there, there, and my two kids, my two kids are absolute sticklers for storytelling. So they would have let me know, their friends would have let me know. Queen Hachi, uh, I did a cheap little gimmick here where I gave her three crown-like tufts of fur at the top of her head. And again, within context, she's slightly bigger. Dialogue will tell you who she is. And then of course, Zambor, who I wrote like uh, Big Dumb Four. Um, so distinctiveness was possible because this really was the extent of my cast as well. So while I could draw thousands of extras, really as a reader, you've got you know, four individuals that you're really dealing with that are within that same class. And so if you could draw you know, a few subtle distinctions between them and then write them in such a way that their voices are distinct, usually you can make those distinctions for the kids. All right, what's next? Ah, this one was a biggie, all right? Villains, everybody likes villains, but, but you know, uh, in nature, you're a villain when you're eating somebody else and a victim when you're being eaten, right? And it can be the same one. Uh, I show clips, I teach a class called Talk Nerdy to Me. And I show students a clip, two clips, um, I think they're both Attenborough. In one, it's all about the gazelles. So we hear about the gazelles, but the cheetah is stalking them. You know, the cheetah is stalking them. And you know, you're like, oh my God, the gazelle's gonna die, you know, no, no, boo, boo, cheetah, boo, cheetah. And then you show the next clip and it's like, the cheetah hasn't fed her cubs in three days. <laughs> if she doesn't get the deer at this time, they could all starve. You're like, oh my God, go cheetah, go, right? <laughs> so, so the thing is, the, the villain of any story, at least in nature, is, is by virtue of your perspective. Right. I think about I love parasitoids because I talked to, you know, I'll tell kids about it. And I can remember a, a, um, a radio lab once where they were talking about a parasitoid taking control of the mind of another organism. And one of the one of the hosts was like, that's evil. And, you know, the other one was like, no, you know, I, no, no, that's evil. That's evil. And they didn't. And I had to turn it off. I'm like, no, because I tell my students, I know what you think about this, this parasitoid flew in like there are forward flies that parasitize leaf cutters right this forward came in behind this gigantic choppy thing darted in you know laid an egg inside its head got away and for what to put its baby in a safe place with plenty of food right that mom's not a monster she's a hero she's super brave so when I did this, I didn't want to have villains. They're definitely antagonists, right? An antagonist is someone who has a separate desire from you. So uh, Miyuki meets a mantis that almost eats her. But by the end of it, you kind of like the mantis. You think she's funny, right? You're glad she didn't eat Miyuki, I hope. Uh, but in the end, you don't dislike the mantis. Here, a crab spider. Uh, had uh, Miyuki in its grasp, and this another creature, uh, this other character, Sisyphus, who's a dung beetle. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that goes back to my liberal arts education. I have to tell this story. I was in uh, uh, I was in an entomology club at Notre Dame. George Craig was running it. It was preparing us for. I didn't actually go to the competition. It was the Linnaean? Yeah, right. We were going quizzes, and everyone. I can remember the kids looking at me and goes, oh, you're a physiologist. You don't really understand your insect. You don't understand your animal. I'm like, come on, guys. And they're like, oh, well, you can be on the team if you want. All right, whatever. But then we get this question. What is the Sisyphus beetle? I'm like, it's got to be a dung beetle, right? <laughs> and they're like, hush. And I'm like, literature, baby. I read literature. Um, so Sisyphus bumps into this flower accidentally, knocks Miyuki free but makes the point of saying later on, I didn't do that on purpose. And Tom had every right to his dinner as you do yours, right? Just worked out, right? Those moments I think are really important for me because it's very, I look at kids who see insects as bad things. 
because they don't want to die and so they might sting you so you don't kill them. <laughs> and it's kind of a perverse logic, but there you have it. All right, so finding a way to write antagonists that weren't villains, this was another challenge. All right, what's next? Oh, and then life is tough. Uh, it's hard to talk about, uh, for example, the second uh, chapter of the book is all about swarming and the fact that there's a new queen coming up, right? And half the colony is gonna go off probably with the old queen unless she decides to stay and fight. And uh, the fact it's hard not to get into what'll happen if she sticks around, which is she's gonna kill her daughter. It's hard to avoid the fact that when the daughter comes out, she's gonna go around to the cells of all the unemerged sisters and kill them too. If we treat that like it's villainous, right? As if it's taboo to talk about, as if kids can't handle it. I think you lose some of the richness and you insult the kids, right? I've never had a kid read this and say, you know what? I think I want to kill my sister too. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever taken anybody out and claimed my neighbors was to blame. So when you're writing stories or telling these stories, uh, I don't think you should shy away from uh, some of the, I sometimes call it elegant brutality of nature. It is there, it's a, it's a, it's a part of it, right? Otherwise you wind up presenting a Pollyannish, disnified view of a life that is is not really very interesting i don't think all right what's the next one ah so why tell stories why are you sort of sort sort of told you this uh this quote is one that sort of guided me has guided me for a long time we can't win the battle to save species and environments without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well, for we will not fight to save what we do not love. Uh, regardless of what you may think about Stephen Jay Gould, and I've got friends who have varying opinions, this is true. Uh, you do the work you do because you love what you do. Um, but uh, most people don't. Most people, as I've told uh, some of my kids in the science communication class, most people don't care what you do. And you can rage at the injustice or how dumb they are not to like what you would, but that's not the point. Your job is to show them why it's amazing. And that's not always easy to do. It's easier to do, at least for me, the vehicle I use is telling stories because people like stories. Our brain is wired for stories. If conspiracy theorists tell us nothing, it is that we are so good at making stuff up and then really believing it, really believing it. We are good at reading a story about a cartoon B and feeling the emotional connection so much that we cry. How is that even possible? I mean, I'll tell another story about crying because crying is funny. Um, <clears throat> I came home, my son Jack was in, um, was in uh, first grade. And I came home from work, walked in the door. Lisa looks up and before she can say anything, Jack comes around and he comes around and he faces me like this. And there's this like, I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's too early in his life for us to be wrestling for territory, right? He looks at me and then his lip starts to quiver. And tears start coming down his eyes. And before Lisa could tell me, Dr. Suba started reading Klein Apis to the first graders. He goes, no more books with dying, dad. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so they didn't even get past the fourth chapter. <laughs> so like Dr. Suba's like, I gotta stop because half the kids, half the kids are crying. Um, and it sounds like I'm self-aggrandizing about this book. The, the point is this really happened, you know, that that stories can impact us emotionally. And when we're impacted emotionally, we want to do something about it. Do we always do something about it? No. But do we shift the probability that we'll do something? Yes. So do I think comics are going to save the world? Absolutely not. Do I think that there might be some kid out there somewhere that might get nudged a little bit? Maybe. Right? Because I uh, have a full understanding of the incremental nature of everything that I do. Right? So we tell stories because they move people. We also tell stories because stories provide 
scaffolding for knowledge, right? I think about the best instructors I ever had. They did not come in. I was talking about C. Mays, who was my, my biochemistry professor. And he came in, he's a very nice man. Uh, came in and it was this intermediate, then this intermediate, then this, and this comes off here. And it was an hour of that three times a week. And that was stultifying. Okay. And then I had another biochemistry class and the guy came in and said, Hey, you know what? ATP is like this. And it does this thing. It's cool a little bit like when you go over there and do that and then sing and they're like, Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, I get ATP now. Right. <clears throat> it's not a weakness to tell stories. It's actually hard to do it effectively and to do it well. And it's not a weakness when your students leave class and remember what you were talking about. <laughs> Some would say that is the point, right? Okay, next slide. How are we doing on time? I'm not boring you guys. Oh, we're just about to. No nope. Oh, great. So a couple more hours. <laughs> <laughs> You don't think I can just keep going? Because I can, baby. I'm talking about myself, and that's my favorite thing. Um, the other thing I do uh, are cartoons, right? Because there's a certain impatience. You know, uh, I will be the first to admit, I love the likes. Oh, I got 62 likes. Because <laughs> I don't have a ton of followers. But, um, <laughs> okay, we're good. Right. So these provide a fun avenue of throwing stuff out there for people to see. And some of them got passed around. I just had a student that came up to me and said, oh, I saw this cartoon on a tarantula website I was on. I'm like, ah, that's, I guess that's cool. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorites just because that's Kushi. And so she's always, she's always interacting with spiders, which I, I love spiders too. Um, now, the thing about these things are, is that it's sort of easy to look at this and say, oh, well, that, that's what you can do. You can do that, Jay. And that, it's true. I can. I can make them look like this. But you don't have to have artistic skill to do this effectively. I'm going to make that point even more dramatically in a little bit. But you don't have to be able to render beautifully, to tell a good, good little joke, whether it's for a presentation or whether you pop something online. And sometimes you can do it in such a way that you tell people about something that's kind of cool. An ant mimicking spider, that's, that's awesome. All right, what's the next slide? I think we're getting into, oh yes, using comics as art and outreach. So this is an invasive species. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes. So <laughs> there are, there are a number of ways, again, that you can go uh, interact in small groups. I've done this with libraries. I've done this with my kids' friends. I've done this in large school visits. Um, and and I, I don't doubt that you already have the things that you do in those situations. So this is maybe not to replace anything you do, but a, an additional arrow in your quiver is a possibility. All right, now I'll make the argument for why I think some of these are effective. Let's see the next one. Um, this is something that elementary students never say. Middle schoolers, a few of them say, but most don't say. I can't draw, that's a high school, college, and grown up thing to say. I can't draw. Uh, everybody can draw. Uh, and what I always like to point out, at least to the college students, when I point out is that I can't draw, but. I can transform bacteria by inserting a new gene into their genome, or I can stick an electrode into a nerve cell and monitor action potentials, or run behavioral and philosophical assays uh, of sleep and fruit fly with Parkinson's model. I can do all of those things. Now, guess what? They weren't doing those in elementary school or high school, right? These are skills that they picked up right now. Uh, the capacity to draw and communicate ideas uh, does not require beautifully fully rendered things, right? Case in point, next slide. XKCD, right? Uh, if you're not familiar with Randall Monroe's work, they all look like this. And they're all, most of them are funny and effective. Um, this one was sent to me by my son who is a mathematician. Uh, 
he liked thinking of me holding a squiggly squid. Um, you, can, you can convey really important complex ideas with simple illustrations. You can, right? And you can do them with stick figures. Um, there, there was a cartoonist who famously couldn't draw. All of his characters were dots, just little dots. And he would have them saying different things. And it was possible to follow what was happening in each panel, right? Easy peasy, right? So you can, if you have the ideas, you can use simple artwork. Now, the thing is, maybe you're like, well, I don't want to draw. Okay, you can still use art in your outreach. So let's see in the next slide. So this is the super complex thing I do with kids when I go to classroom visits. I draw a single insect on the board, very rudimentary, even usually more rudimentary than this. This is when I did over Zoom and I had my nice touch screen that I could do. But when I'm at the board, it's even more sticks and figures than this. <clears throat> so I go into a classroom, I'm like, okay, what's the first part of an insect? A head, good. Anybody tell me what you know about the insect head. And this is the key. You tell me what you know about an insect head. And the kids get to tell me something. All right, well, that's great. All right, let's, let's got an eye there. So we draw the eye. Anybody know anything interesting about the eye? Oh, you know, uh, it's got multiple facets, right? And so then I can springboard off of what they've given me, right? To give a little more detail. Oh, well, let's draw the antenna. What does the antenna do? And they're sitting there drawing with me. So their engagement is physical. They're drawing something. And, and they're also engaged mentally in terms of thinking about what this is and how this works, right? They got just as absolutely giddy as can be when I told them that the antenna was like a, a tongue, nose, finger, hydrometer, speedometer. You know, you probably go on, right? <laughs> I'm putting this again, not to self-aggrandize, but a friend of mine had a daughter in that class. They had an elementary school graduation, which is psychotic. I know, but we live in a small town where every little thing is exciting. So, but apparently several students said this, this visit was their big thrill of fifth grade. Now it's not because of me, it's because as I'm going through this thing, they're telling me like, oh, I saw a butterfly with this kind of wings. Now, they were part, their experience became folded into the experience. Of course, I, I mean, it goes without saying, once I got the butt end and we got to the sting, that's where most of the stories came from. My grandma poured, you know, oil down a hole and killed the bees. I'm like, oh, I'm good. All right. <laughs> the point is that uh, most of you, most of us can draw two, three, like three circles, some loops on the back, one, two, three, four, five, six, antenna, antenna, circle, da, 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 insect. Right, And if you do that with the kids, and that's the key, if they're doing it with you, even if it's just sitting around a table and they get to interact and they get to tell you stuff and that allows you to tell them stuff. Because the thing is, I've had kids, they don't want me constantly telling them stuff, but if they can tell me some stuff and I can tell them stuff, then it's a conversation, then it, that's okay, right? All right, what's the next slide? Oh, yes. Here's where we get to the point of, of, I don't care if you're afraid, they're not. I oftentimes take four panel, blank four panels, pieces of paper, right? And I say, you know what? Um, we're gonna draw a story about an insect. You can do whatever you want. I said, but you know, it's always kind of cool if you can do it about something you experienced. And I never get them because the kids never want to give them to me. I always want one. Can I have one to scan it? Right, they, they always want to keep them, which is awesome. I mean, and I don't really want to take them to it, but, but they generate some amazing things. Um, one kid saw leaf cutter ants on a vacation down south and they thought it was the most amazing thing. And they drew the ant marching and singing some song that he made up, right? Another little girl talked about a butterfly experience she had at you know, a natural museum and it landed on her nose. Right, and she drew it on her nose and it was adorable. Everybody was into it because everyone had a bug story to tell. And so you don't even have to do that. You don't even have to make one. 
you can put that out for them and they'll fill it in. And what have you done? They have created a story. So they've written something, they've drawn something, and they've had this really cool, pleasant experience thinking about insects. All right? Okay. Next slide's the one you've been waiting for. And... <laughs> So I, I'll answer questions. And... Sure, you bet, you bet. Yes. What program do I draw on? Um, it's the neural circuitry that's right up here and it sends it down to my fingers. Uh, so I draw on Bristol board. Uh, the pages of a typical book are drawn at 10 by 15 dimensions. They're usually shrunk down to about 60 to 50% of that. Um, I use a blue pencil that's non-photographic, right? Yeah. Ah, does that have one right there? Yeah, another cartoonist, right? Boom. And so <clears throat> I draw an entire page with this non-photographic blue. And what that means is I can draw the page and then I apply ink over it. Ah, there it is, right? And so so I can apply the ink over. Now I used to do it in just regular pencil and draw the ink over it and then erase it, but then you lift up the line work. Um, and so this way I can do that, do the inking, and then I put it on a copier at work, hit reduce, and the copier is like a photograph. It does not take the blue. So all of that underdrawing that I did disappears and I have this really nice clean thing. So it's all hand. Um, and, but then I go home and I scan it in the, in the computer. The coloring, I usually don't color it, right? So for my books, I have a colorist, um, um, Hillary Sycamore and her daughter, Karina, Karina Edwards. And um, for short stories, I'll color those. And for that, I use Photoshop. In a, and as my oldest son who uses Photoshop more effectively than I do says, a very ooga booga approach uh, to Photoshop, but yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. What ink do I use? I uh, hit. So I use Kohenor Rapidograph technical pens. All right, uh, and they uh, are mechanical pens, and they come in various line weights. And it comes with. Oh, you know what? Uh, hold on. I, you know, this is the type of thing that any decent person that didn't have a Teflon brain like I do would be able to remember because I've used it for every. It's Rapidograph Ultra Draw. Ooh, I have no idea it was called Ultra Draw. 23 years together. Um, so, yeah. And then what I'll do is I'll fill, fill the cartridges there. I also use um, a, a Kurataki brush pen. Uh, and this was hard for me to buy because it's a $35 pen, but I'm like, okay, I've done two books. I'm worth it. And so I spent it and it's really nice. So there are times when, <coughs> you know, technical pens are nice because they give you a really nice, solid, steady line. There are times when you want to taper in that line for various region, reasons. And I'm not proficient with a brush and dipping it in ink. So this, this Kurataki pen has been really good as sort of a bridge. Yep. Right, right, right. Okay, so the question is, the, the question is, um, how do I find the line between what essentially is too much information for, or, or making something inaccessible? That's not an easy one. Um, and for me, uh, my primary barometers are Lisa, Max, and Jack. I mean, I mean, it sounds uh, like a cop out. I mean, I feel like on my own, I can figure out and I get it really close. But if there's any doubt, I run it by 
you know, the mathematician, the anthropologist, and the middle school science teacher, right? And if they all say, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, the best piece of advice, though, that I've ever been given about comics was given to me by Gib Bickle, who is the owner and the operator of Laughing Ogre Comics. If you ever go there, it does kind of look like Laughing Orgy. And one, one person came into protest until they realized what it was. Um, the Laughing Ogre Comics. And, and he said to me, because I, I was expressing the same concern, you know, what if I say too much for a kid? What if, I, what if I try to do something and the kids just don't get it? And he's like, kids, and this was before I had kids, but he had kids. Kids will just hum through the bits they don't, they don't get if there's enough there to hold on to, right? So just to be totally crass, uh, there are poo-poo and farty jokes in my comics periodically. Why? Because, you know, you, maybe you don't understand ploidy, but I get that, that I get, right? And so if you have humor and various things that anchor, kids will move through. And this is really, a lot of the reading data suggests this is the way they read books too, right? They will, they'll, they'll pass over words they don't really understand, but there's enough context provided there that they can keep moving. It doesn't slog them down. So, um, what I typically try to hold on to in terms of explanations are things that are a little more concrete, right? Um, and if I have, if I, I don't, I, like for example, in, in the V book, I don't get into ploidy. I do talk about, um, but I do talk about the fact that the queen, when she goes to lay her eggs, boy or girl, it's dependent on how big that cell is, right? And so there's a little bit of that, but not, you know, it's, it is a balancing act, right? Because you swing too far one way, there's just not enough story there to move you through, right? You can slog down. You don't want to swing the other way where it's all story and it's just, you're using bees as props. So I didn't really answer your question. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a feel thing. It really is. Sure, absolutely, you could. Um, See, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits of not being the sharpest pencil in the box is that you have a sense of what it feels like not to really understand what's going on, right? I do, I absolutely. I'm like, oh, blah. and so part of, part of my own life experience is that, you know, I have, I don't know, I guess I have a sense of, okay, here's what it comes down to. I have a sense of what I would have struggled with. I have a sense of what I would have found a daunting, something that would have hung me up. And it's those places that I will spend more work, right? So I guess at the end, it's, it's navigating dumb young Jay, right? Not dumb, but, but that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, was there a point in which science, storytelling, and art all came together? So for me, until I realized there was math involved and then I got into uh, physiology and that's not true there's lots of math and physiology too it's just the math I like to do so there was always this sort of track for science um, in the natural world um, at the same time I'm sort of running in parallel an interest in comics like I, I read lots of Charlie Brown I read lots of um, so that was the comic strip and I read lots of Spider-Man and, and you know you can see uh, two primary characters who are nerds that no one likes, but that you sense at some level are special in a way, right? Peter Parker was special, Charlie Brown was special. It's a great narrative to tell yourself when you feel like a dork, right? And so those stories sort of resonated with me. Um, and so read comics for a long time, tried to copy them, emulate them. When I got to college and graduate school, um, I started doing comics for the newspapers, right? 
Um, and they were really banal, right? Not very good. They were, you know, oh, the bookstore is expensive. Oh, I don't get any dates. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, the, you know, oh, the food sucks, you know, whatever. Not very, but what it was, was this great practice because I had deadlines in two a week as an undergraduate. And then I had a, a daily strip five times a week for five years as a graduate student. So five times a week, I got to come up with something because, oh, there would be a blank slot in the paper. So this is forced attempt, you know, work to write and, and draw. But it is bizarre that for the longest time, really the first time there was an overlap was when I had to draw, I wanted to draw dinosaurs. You know, now you can go into Barnes and Noble and there are practically sections on fully illustrated dinosaur books. And I had two. And I really, you know, and, and they always cheated me. It was always T-Rex coming in, right? The Triceratops and they're just about to hit battle and then nothing, right? Because apparently they didn't want to show us goring each other. So if I wanted T you know, Triceratops to win that battle, I had to draw it myself. And so in order to see that behavior, in order to see that science, I had to do it myself. But then they kind of popped off and they went parallel for the longest time until I was getting ready for my postdoc. And my postdoc, I was transitioning from essentially doing electrophysiology to looking at learning and behavior and, and more brain stuff. And so I read uh, Mark Winston's the, the Biology of the Honeybee and it's written, I think, really, really well, beautifully. And the story was there and I was like, oh, Someone should make this a comic. And that's, that was when, well, a year later, the appropriate synapse fired. And I thought, oh, I could do that. And that's, that's really when they came together. So it was right as I was moving into my postdoc. Yeah. And it, what was nice about it was that, you know, um, I suddenly felt like I had something interesting to con contribute to the medium, right? That... I didn't want to write superhero comics. And, I, and the, the other comics I was writing were boring and not very interesting, but this, this was different. This was, a, this was a unique perspective. And so when you feel like you're contributing, it sometimes inspires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Says, how do you tell a difficult story such as evolution, namely, how do you convey universe was not created over seven days and that life forms evolved over millennia. Okay, so the question is, how do you tell a story about evolution um, that occurred over millennia versus um, uh, seven days? So let's just say, this cards on the table. Uh, religion has some great stories. Okay. They don't make any sense most of the time. A lot of the time, the creation story certainly does in terms of time path, but they've got a story, baby. They've got a story that you can lock into and you can tell yourself, right? And that story has characters, two main characters, right? And, and so that is, that is super powerful uh, for conveying ideas. So I did write a book called Evolution. It was illustrated by Xander Cannon and Kevin Cannon, two good friends, but not brothers. Um, here's the approach I took. Um, uh, I had an alien scientist named Blort. Now, uh, I should say, the Evolution book, this book was the second book in a series. The first one was called The Stuff of Life. And the premise that I used was already created. So in The Stuff of Life, it was about a um, alien scientist who's like uh, essentially a sea cucumber that walked around, had you know eyeballs, and they had come to Earth to study human or Earth genetics, and they were going to take that information back to their planet because they were having some sort of unspecified genetic crisis, right? So, very good book written by Mark Schultz. Um, he couldn't do the follow-up book, Evolution. So Xander Cannon, it was a friend of mine from SPX a small press desk in, in, in Bethesda. He gave my name to the editor, editor called me. So I took that premise. So here, here's how I did evolution, because it's tough. You, a single level individual does not evolve, right? We can all agree on that. Uh, <laughs> and it is a populations that evolve. And so, so how do you tell that story over multiple, multiple, multiple generations? It's not easy. And so you can't take that, I couldn't take that approach. The approach I took was that 
Blore had done some studying, he returned to his planet and he created a holographic museum of earthly evolution. So his king and the kings, the prince came to the grand opening and Blort was their tour guide through this holographic museum. And Darwin could pop up and it wouldn't be bizarre, right? Um, other individuals could pop up, right? At some points they could be walking around and see a um, holographic uh, depiction of mRNA, RNA, right? So you didn't have to take the characters and we're gonna hit you with a shrink down beam. You're in a cell, we're gonna make you an enlarged beam, right? You know, it was just because it was a museum, you could just have them navigating through this world at all sorts of different levels. And honestly, that's that little bit of thing. I mean, I don't have great ideas very often, but I look at that and I go, well, oh, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. Right? Because it saved me from a lot of the sort of cartoony, quirky things. But because it was a museum, you could just move through the eras. You could, I mean, there's a page where they're moving through the time periods and they're looking at trilobites. Oh, there's a lot here. Oh, there are more, there are more, there are more, there are more. They're not there anymore. Right? And so um, it allows that. The other thing that it allowed was um, elements for wonder which I, I didn't really mention in here, but this is the one thing that my experience coming through in my training is um, most of us feel the wonder. We're not super effective or even sometimes comfortable sharing that wonder or allowing space for that wonder. So one of the things that I wanted in the book was, I said, okay, good. They're gonna be going through this thing and they're gonna be talking about critters. And then they're, you know, bottom right-hand page they're going to be standing, you know, near the, uh, the beginning of the Triassic. Is that right? It's Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous, right? Jurassic was first. Anyway, they're at the very beginning of that, and they're standing by these great big trees, it looks like. But of course, you can see the toes. It's going to be a sauropod. And I'm like, look, this is what we got to do. They're going to turn the page, and it is just going to be a two-page spread of dinosaurs. Just dinosaurs, no talking. And the editor's like, <laughs> two pages without content? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <coughs> There's content. There are dinosaurs. And the other content is wonder. Because I'll tell you right now, six-year-old Jay turns that page. That's where Jay's going to stay for a while. Oh, it's Diplodocus. Ah, oh, it's Pachycephalosaurus. Oh, they're hidden heads, right? I mean, and Kevin and Xander, did something beyond what I could imagine. It was sort of this three quarters aerial shot of this landscape and all these different critters all over it. <coughs> if you're interested, I brought a couple copies of that book. I can show you. That was, that was the biggest battle I had in that book is getting that two page spread because I was giving up content area. But the problem is that content is what grown up editors like and wowee moments are what kids like. And if that's who you're writing for, you have to keep that in mind. So um, yeah, evolution is tough. Um, there are also increasing number of short-term examples you can use. Industrial melanism, right? That's an easy piece one. And it's cool because uh, the experiments that were done were actually pretty straightforward and interesting to look at too, so. Sure, like how yeah right so so uh let me where's my bag here so this is Hey, buddy. Hey, don't you pass this down? So um, this, this comic, on one side of this, it's a two-page comic, uh, the one that was with um, Adriana's paper. In the, <laughs> did anyone get one? 
and um, the references at the bottom. So I'm going to go back up there. I need so uh, you can read it now, you can read it later, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So the comic that I just passed around, 12 panels, two pages. Arguably, the there are one, maybe one and a half panels that are the signs. Okay. So her paper is quite extensive, really interesting, really good. And I really spend probably, we'll, we'll say two panels outlining the science. Everything else around it provides story and context. So if you're reading that, tell me what the, what is the mirror? Yep. The breakup, right? Because a lot of people have been through breakups, been in relationships, right? And what's the window? Co-evolving with planned is one. What else? Right, learning about the dimorphism, the fact that they're picking a plant based on taste, and they're tasting through their legs, <laughs> with their feet. Right. So if you're a non, if you're a non entomologist, that's like, wow, what? What the hell? So, um, so yeah, so for this two pages and not, not a ton of space left specifically to explain the science, but I would argue enough contextualization that what I do tell you, you're, you're likely to remember, right? All right, any other questions? Great questions. Yep. And this one says really quick more about the art side. Um, I see it again here and with uh, the little ant friend. Um, when you're simplifying the design, but you still want it to be recognizable as the original creature, because we are referencing the creatures. Um, I don't know, what's, what's your, your take on when you're trying to, like, when you went from the leaf cutter ant to this design, how are you like, I want to preserve the fact that it's a leaf cutter ant? Yeah, so, um, so Kushi technically, you find on the stories, she's all ants, right? So, but um, I do actually, you know, do the same thing. So if you look at this, right? Heads are important. Heads are important for expressiveness, right? And so I always imagine what I do when I draw them, I draw them with no mandibles with the mouth I want. And then I erase this bit right here because the cartoon bit can be, you know, rubbery, right? Um, I honestly, for a lot of the books, the, the stories that I'm writing for my students, I want it to do happen fast. So I, I, I created her for that reason, to do it relatively quickly. You know, she's got a tube-like body, but thorax, right? Abdomen, and note that I don't have legs coming off here. They're coming off at the bottom of the thorax. So I, I, it is important to me that all the legs are in the thorax. Um, and so I've, I've turned it into the body, into this tube-like thing. And of course, this is not quite as articulated <laughs> as your typical insect. I've gone with the stick set. But um, so uh, I don't think there's any clear cut reason why, but I mean, um, or how this is a design. I, so I played with this in my sketchbooks. I have a whole bunch of different iterations of this. And this was the one that sort of came out as relatively easy to reproduce, right? It's still recognizable. All right, thank you. Can I make it so I can see me again? Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jay. That was that was oh man, very inspiring and uh, a totally new one for this society, which I love about. The banquet is we can really mix things up. That was really wonderful. Um, for those of us here, the bookstore um, back there uh, has some of Jay's books for sale that you can purchase and then bring to Jay to get him to sign them.
So uh, please take part of that. And we're gonna hang out here for a little while longer. For those of you in Zoom land, if you're still like in the area and wanna come on over, there's, there's space here. Um, but other than that, I think we'll wrap things up. Um, we're on our summer hiatus and we'll be returning back to the regular meeting schedule. Is it September? October. October. And it's still to be determined what that meeting format's going to look like. Um, I'm hoping uh, hybrid like this and that we're back in the National Museum of Natural History in some room, but that we're able to access the rest of the world through, through Zoom. That's the hope. Um, if not, it'll be depends on National Museum's uh, policy uh, at that time. So thanks again, Jay. Thanks everyone for participating. Thank you, Audubon Sanctuary for letting uh, us use your space again. And uh, have a good summer, everyone.